Hey friends, because this is the last week of school, I figured I would send you off with one extra read aloud for the week. Um, it has filled me with joy to the point where I think I need to go buy some more books for some read alouds. Uh, this has definitely been a joy being able to read. I'm a little bit biased because I have a favorite author and sometimes I just prefer reading her books. So anyways, uh, this story is another Patricia Flacco and is called Pink and Say. When Sheldon Russell Curtis told this story to his daughter, Rosa, she kept every word in her heart and was to retell it many times over in her long lifetime. Sheldon had been injured in a fierce battle and was left for dead in a muddy, blood-soaked pasture somewhere in Georgia. He was a lad of maybe 15. He lay there for two days by his reckoning only to slip into unconsciousness and fever. He was rescued from this field by another lad who had also been separated from his company. I will let I will tell it in his own words as nearly as I can. I watched the sun edge towards the center of the sky above me. I was hurt real bad. For almost a year I'd been in this man's war, the war between the states. Just being a lad, I was wishing I was home. My leg burned and was angry from the lead ball that was lodged in it just above my knee. I felt sleepy and everything would go black and then I'd wake up again and I wanted to go back to our farm in Ohio and, well, sometimes when I'd fall into one of those strange sleeps, I'd be there with my ma, tasting baking powder biscuits fresh out of her wood stove. And then I heard a voice. For a moment, I thought it was fever dreaming, but then I felt strong hands touch my brow and splash water onto my face. Being here, boy, means you gotta be dead, the voice said as he gave me a drink from his kit. Were you hit? Because if it's a belly hit, I gotta leave you here, he said. I had never seen a man like him so close before. His skin was the color of polished mahogany. He was flying union colors like me, my age, maybe. But his voice was soothing and his help was really good. Hit in the leg, I told him. Not bad if it don't go green. Can you put any weight on it? He asked as he pulled me to my feet. We got to keep going. If we stay in one spot, the people will find us and they're riding and dragging and they're looking for the wounded. Next thing I remember, I was collapsing in a heap on the ground and rocking with the pain in my leg. Everything started to go black. And then I remember him pulling me on his back and I heard him say, Lord, have mercy, child. You as bad off as I am. I'll tote you. I can't rightly leave you here. I remember being pulled and carried and stumbling. I remember hard branches snapping back in my face and mouths full of dirt as we hit the ground to keep from being seen. I remember slogging through the streams, hauling up small bluffs and belly crawling through dry fields. I remember these things in half sleep, but I do remember being carried for a powerful long way. Then fever must have took me good because I could feel a cool, sweet smelling quilt next to my face. Soft, gentle, warm hands were stroking my head with a cool, wet rag cloth. Look at that morning that's coming, a woman's voice said as she spooned oat porridge into me. Do your mama know what a beautiful baby boy she has? Where, where, where am I? I asked. She tossed her head and laughed, no child. Pink has brought you home to me, don't you remember? The mahogany child, I thought. Both you children been on the run for days and a miracle of God brought you both here. Yes, indeed, child, definitely a miracle. I remember thinking, could this war have been so close to this child's home? 
I can't even imagine having a war right in my backyard. I looked over and saw him looking out the window light. I guess you don't remember much, he says. I'm Pincus Ailey. I fought with the 48th colored. And I found you after you after I got lost from my company. My name is Sheldon. Sheldon Curtis, I said weakly. This is my mother, sweet Mo Mo Bay, he said as he smiled at me. Lord, Lord, I never thought I'd see my dear boy again, she said as she hugged him. I've been getting along, though, Pincus. Warm things got left in the house when the family left. Dry goods, too. The rest I've been getting from the woods. There's a fresh water spring. Still have some chickens, and I even have a cow out back that still gives milk. Then you've been all alone here, Pincus asked his mother. Where is everybody? Your daddy ran off and fought to fight a month ago, and all the hands and their children ran off and out of our harm's way. But I stayed. I prayed to the Lord every day. My prayers were answered because he brought my baby back here to stay, she said as her face beamed. You are never going to leave your mama again, are you, child? She said softly. Pincus looked troubled and didn't answer. I'm going to go down to the stream and pound these clothes of yours, she said as she ready to leave us. If you hear the people coming, get for the root cellar door and stay there until they're gone. That's what I've been doing anyways. The people, Pincus said with alarm. Yeah, they, they've seen there's nothing here for them, though, child. Not a thing. The people that they're talking about are like people who come to basically steal everything from the people um, and basically take it for their provisions for their group. It's They're called marauders. It's a very weird word. As soon as she left us, Pinka sank to my bedside. Sheldon boy, he whispered. As soon as you heal up, we got to get away from here. We're putting Momo Bay in great danger by being here, and if they come and find that she's been holding troopers, his voice then trailed off. We gotta get back to our outfits if we can find them. You mean back to war? I asked. I must have gone pale as he went on to say, it's the only way, ain't it? He looked at me. Sheldon, you all right? You look bothered, he said as he eased me back. You can call me Say, I said. Everybody in my family calls me Say, not Sheldon. I expect you're my family now. Near enough, say near enough, he said as he chuckled the blank, chucked the blanket under my feet. You can call me pink, he said as softly as he smiled. For the next week, Momo Bay fed us both real good raw milk. Raw milk is uh, milk that comes straight from a cow. It, but like the milk that we typically drink from the store, it goes to a processing plant and is processed with like extra vitamins and I think things like that. But raw milk comes straight from a cow without anything processed. Um, cornbread never tasted so good in all of my days. It was the first time in months my vittles didn't have any mealy worms in it. She saw to it that I tried to walk a little every day. So does that mean looking like don't go stiff on you and you cripple up, she'd say. This place wasn't that much different from our farmhouse in Ohio. More poor maybe, but it smelled the same, like pine boards and good cooking. A mess of beans with salt pork, cornbread, greens, and onions. When we slept, she sat near us, stoked the fire and watched over us. Never thought I'd feel safe enough to sleep deep again. My mother and Kalo, my father, jumped the broom on this very spot, Pink said, as he walked me on my first day outdoors. Uh, jumping the broom is like getting married, but it's a tradition, a traditional thing uh, in African-American culture to jump the, the, the broom. Uh, my mother, oh, Pink, and say, Pink said as he walked me on my first day outdoors, and that there was the master's house, Master A. Lee. Pink spoke quietly as he helped me along. Why do you have his last name, I asked. Boy, when you owned, you ain't got no name of your own. Even Kalo had to take that name. As we rested under the willow tree, Pink asked me about my family back home. I got one brother still at home to help run the place for Pa, I answered. 
What was your outfit again? Pink asked. He'd asked me that before. Ohio 24th. I carried the staff. I wasn't supposed to carry a gun, but then so many died, even us boys had to carry after so many were, were killed. Well, at least you got to carry. In the 48th, we couldn't have guns at first. We fought with sticks and hammers and sledges. Can you imagine not trusting us with our own fight? I couldn't imagine such a thing. When they did finally give us muskets, muskets or guns, uh, they were from the Mexican-American War and they jammed and misfired. Well, how in the world can, why, do you, why would you want to go back, I asked. Because it's my fight, say. Ain't it yours too? If we don't fight, who will? I had no answer for him, but God forgive me, I did never want to go back to the war. After a few more days, I could walk a little steadier, but I still needed help. Pink took me out by the big house and walked me through it. There wasn't much left of it, really. It was mostly burned out. Master Ailey had a library full of books right here, he said, and he taught me to read, even though it was against the law. He must have been a good man, I said. More bad than good, say. Sometimes I think he just liked being read to. There, there was this book of poetry, say, that was, his th that was this thick. Every night I would read out loud to him from that book. I blessed this house because of all those beautiful books, but I cursed it too for what it stood for. We walked a bit further. To be born a slave is a heap of trouble, say. But after Ailey taught me to read, even though he owned my person, I knew that no one could ever really own me. Pink, you feel hot. Are you feel hot, Pink? I said. Lord, I think you're as sick as me. Let me get you back to the house. I'm going to be fine, just a little tired, that's all. I'll be ready to fight, though. I'll be ready to fight. That night after we ate, Momo Bay came back to the table with a worn old Bible, and she was just so happy. My heart ached at the thought of telling her we'd be leaving soon. Master Ailey showed him how paper talks. Show him pink, she said. He took out a pair of spectacles from his pocket and opened the Bible to the Psalms of David and began to read. His voice was steady and had such wonder. Just hearing them words made pictures come into my head. I surely do wish I could read, I said to them without thinking. When Pink saw I was ashamed, he took my hand. I'ma teach you, say. One day, I'll teach you. I could feel my fl face flushing up and then I spoke up. I'd done something important, I announced. Of course you, ch you have, child. You, of course you have, his mother said. Well, I touched Lincoln's hand. It was near Washington. We were quartered just before there, just before Bull Run, and the president himself was shaking everyone's hand, and, well, I just put my hand right out. And he took it, Pink asked. Yep, he took it, I answered. Now there's a sign, ain't it, he said, smiling broadly. Touch my hand, Pink. Now you can say you touched the hand that shook the hand of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln. The next best thing to touch in him, Mo Mo Bay said in wonder. Most of the next day, Pink was studying an old map. Marauders don't fan out farther than 30 miles or so from their camps. If they came here, then their units must be that close. We gotta get south of the river. See here, say? This is where my troops were headed. We can meet up with them about here, I figure. Meet up with who? You aren't leaving, his mother's voice caught up, caught as she came upon us. Now, my mother knew you, you ugh. Now, my mother, you knew we couldn't stay here. You had to know that, he said as he tried to calm her. No, no, my babies, my dear babies, she cried. She was inconsolable for a time, and then she sat still, feared as she just listened. Mother... This war has to be won or this sickness that has taken this land will never stop. Pink always called slavery the sickness when we talked. We have to go, he knelt at her feet. By the time, by the, by the look that came into her eyes, she knew that this day was coming. I could feel my breathing catch. My chest was heavy. My hands were sweating and I felt sick at my stomach and I knew I had to tell Pink something. I just didn't know how.
that night. I couldn't sleep. What's wrong, child? Momo Bay said from her chair. I don't want to go back, I blurted out. I know, child. Of course you don't, she said. You don't understand. I ran away from my unit. I was hit when I was running. I sobbed so hard, my ribs hurt. I'm a coward and a deserter. She looked at the fire and said nothing for the longest time, and then her voice covered my cries. You ain't nothing of the kind. You a child, a, a child. Of course you're scared. There isn't anybody that isn't. But I'm not brave like Pink. I'm not brave. Child, being brave don't mean you ain't afraid. Don't you know that? But I don't want to die. There's things worse than death, child, but you got nothing to fear. You are here now, and I'm hugging you up. You're going to be an old man someday, and when it's time, the sweet Lord will send a hummingbird to fly your soul to heaven. Now you ain't afraid of hummingbirds now, are you? Her words brought me sweet sleep. That night, I dreamt of hummingbirds and green pastures full of sunlight and wildflowers. The next morning, we mustered to leave. We packed cornbread, salt pork, and dried beans. I would have done just about anything to stay, but my place was to go with Pink. I owed him that. Just as we were making the last sweep of the place, making sure there were no signs of us ever being there, we heard wild screams and shrieks coming from the woods. Marauders, Pink said as he grabbed a piece of wood for a club. Momo Bay took it from him. Get to the root cellar. They ain't got no truck with an old dark woman. You get to the dark cellar. We didn't like it, but then she pushed us. Hurry before they're here. She lifted the root cellar door and shoved us in. Don't come out till I tell you. We heard the porch steps creak as she ran from the cabin. She's drawn them off, Pink whispered. When the marauders came in, my heart was pounding so hard. I wish they could hear it up there. I, I'm sure they could hear it up there. There was a terrible commotion as they ransacked, looking for food, and there was silence. And then a single shot echoed through the trees outside. They let out a war whoop as they thundered off. We waited for a sign from Momo Bay, but it didn't come. Finally, we waited for us. Uh, we finally we climbed out and ran outside, only to see Momo Bay lying just beyond the porch. <clears throat> we put you in harm's way by staying here. Pink cried as he rocked her in his arms. Her eyes were looking in a faraway place, and he closed them. Your son loves you, Momo Bay. Your son loves you. He sobbed and he kissed her. We both held her hand and until there was no more warmth left in it. After we buried her under the willow tree, we set out. Pink figured we were three days walk from the Union troops and he watched the movement of the sun. Her words still rang in my heart. Her words about being brave. My steps were as sure now as they'd ever been since the war started. We walked in the open as clear as a country stroll until the morning of the second day, and then we knew we were being followed. Take these, Pink said as he took his spectacles from his pocket. If they catch me with them, there'll be trouble for sure. When they caught up to us, one of them yelled at me, Where are you going with that dark boy? I was afraid to answer because of my northern accent. I would be a dead giveaway for sure. Boy, what outfit are you a part of? The leader barked. I couldn't answer. Are you a union boy? One jeered as he pulled my uniform from my knapsack. No, I ain't no Yankee. I got that from a dead one, I sputtered trying to convince them. That was when we were grabbed. My words had given us away. We were prisoners of the Confederate Army. We were held up in a barn that night. Pink shivered with fever, and I, I knew I held him as he had done for me. The next morning, we were thrown into a boxcar, and we rode for what seemed like two days, stopping many times. When the door opened, the daylight was blinding, and we were loaded into a buckboard and taken through town. The townsfolk looked hard at us. All they had left for us was mean looks and heaps of hate. We drive to a stop in front of the gates that marked the entrance to a stockade. It says Andersonville, Pink whispered. My heart stopped. I knew I had heard of this place. It was one of the worst Confederate camps.
When we were pulled from the buckboard, we fell hard to the ground. No, no, I begged as they pulled us both along. Because of his fever, Pink stumbled and fell. They dragged him along with such meanness, he did not protest until they forced us in different directions. And then he reached out his hand for me and said, let me touch the hand that touched Mr. Lincoln, say, just one last time. I watched tears fill his eyes and cleaved my hand to his until they wrenched us apart. They smote him and dragged him away from me, and he looked back at me and tried to say something more, but they crossed his back with knotted hemp and pushed him along. Sheldon Russell Curtis was released from Andersonville prison some months later, weighing no more than 78 pounds. Andersonville was built to hold only 10,000 prisoners, but by the end of the war, it held 33,000 soldiers. There was no fresh water, no shelter, and no food. 13,000 men and boys died of starvation and dysentery. Sheldon Curtis returned to his home and recovered. He settled in Berlin Township in Saranac, Michigan, and he married Abigail Barnard and fathered seven children. He became a grandfather and a great-grandfather during his long lifetime, and he died a very old man at 1924. Pincus Ailey never returned home. For him, there was to be no wife, no children, nor grandchildren to remember him. It was told that he was hung within hours after he was taken into Andersonville and his body was thrown into a pit. I know this story to be true Ooh. <laughs> because Sheldon Cur Russell Curtis told his daughter Rosa. Rosa Curtis Stowell told it to her daughter Estella. Estella Stowell Barber, in turn, told it to her son, William. And then he told it to me, his daughter, Patricia. When my father finished this story, he put out his hand and said, This is the hand that touched the hand, that touched the hand, that shook the hand of Abraham Lincoln. This book serves as a written memory of Pincus Ailey, since there are no living descendants to do this for him. When you read this, before you put this book down, say his name out loud and vow to remember him always. Pincus Ailey. Friends, a lot of, a lot of depth to this book and a lot of history to this book. And this is a story that was told through the generations. Thank you for joining me on that journey.